The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Modern plagues, social tensions, economic crises, and rampant depression. Where do we go from here? You know, uh, the Bible always brings us back to the fact that God is in control and that none of this has escaped his, I mean, God in, I, I have a wonderful saying, a little girl said one time that God never says oops. <laughs> you know, he never yeah. says, oh, how did this happen? Right. David Jeremiah, next. Hi, welcome to Life Today. I'm Sheila Walsh, and I'm so glad you joined us, and you're gonna be really glad you joined us too. One of the great things about working here at Life is I get the privilege of reading so many amazing books, but every now and again, one book comes along and you think, this is a book for this time, and this is something God breathed, and that's certainly how I feel about this book. It's called, Where Do We Go From Here? And it's by one of my favorite people on the planet. Welcome, Dr. David Jeremiah. Sheila, thank you for having me. Now, we're thrilled that you're here. I wanted to ask you first, as a pastor, have you ever known a time that is as chaotic as this? You know, Sheila, I have a little thing that I've, I've said for years that wisdom is best defined as doing the right thing without a precedent. Hmm. And I've thought to myself, we need wisdom now because everything is unprecedented. That's so we, true. we have never had any time like this. There's nothing to which we can compare it. Yeah. You have um, a passionate commitment to, to biblical prophecy. Why is that so important to you? Well, first of all, prophecy is one fourth of the Bible. Wow. A lot of people say, I don't preach on prophecy. They've already admitted that they only preach 75% of the Bible. Uh, but prophecy is, you know, one of the things I learned when I first started doing this was wherever there's a prophetic passage, there's a practical application to it. For instance, I'll just give you an illustration. One of the best known prophetic passages is John 14. Uh, Let not your heart be troubled. In my father's house are many men. There's the prophecy yeah. and there's the practice. Don't, don't be troubled because God's got this. Wow. And th that's the way prophecy is throughout all of, all of the prophetic scriptures. Th prophecy has an ultimate meaning and it has a current meaning. Mm -hmm. And the current meaning is always vibrant and yeah. very helpful. I, I love the subtitle, how tomorrow's prophecies foreshadow today's problems. What did you mean by that? I kind of discovered that when I was beginning to think about this project, I began to realize that um, for instance, at the time I wrote this book, we were in the midst of a pandemic. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of things in the Bible uh, where, where Jesus spoke about in the end time, there's gonna be pestilences. Mm -hmm. I used to think that was important information and I believed it was true because it was in the Bible, but I couldn't imagine a worldwide pestilence. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden one day I realized, oh my goodness, what Jesus said was gonna happen in the future some of it's happening right now. Yeah. How the future prophecies foreshadow our current problems. That's, that's where they came from. Does God use something like a pandemic like COVID-19 to get our attention? Well, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know if he does or not. It doesn't seem to have worked. No, that's true. <laughs> I look around and I see people yeah. going back to the same old stuff. And, you know, I remember when 9-11 uh, happened, we had this incredible surge in our churches and everybody was saying that America was coming back to God. People were coming back to God. And it was that way for a few weeks until everybody settled back into their norms. What I think happens with pandemics, w which are more prolonged than a 9-11, mm. they just make you do things you've never done before in a way you never did them before and you can't get away from it. Yeah. You have to you have to change and some of the changes are for good. Yeah. You, in the book, you break it down into 10 different um, subjects and we will get to as many as we can. Um, but I want to, you to talk about an international prophecy, globalism. Um, what does the Bible have to say about a more global World. Well, Sheila, the first great globalist was Nimrod, mm. the guy from the Old Testament who built the tower and tried to bring everybody together. 
and uh, they all had one language and they were going to reach up and they were going to be God. That's yeah. what they hoped to do. And then God saw that, as you know, and he confounded the languages. And ever since then, men have been trying to figure out a way to to bring everything together so it can be under one. Yeah. In the in the Bible, it tells us that in the future, that's going to happen. Yeah. The Antichrist will come and he will he will rule over every tribe, every people, every language. That's what that's what the book of Revelation says. And so there's this this attempt today. In fact, very interesting. Right when this book was being written, somebody sent me a picture of the new World Religion Center, which is in Dubai. Wow. And it's being built primarily by the Roman Catholic Church and is in Islam. Wow. And they're coming together to find out what things they can agree on so they can lead into this new, quote, global religion. It's very present with us. I read a statistic just the other day, and I don't remember who did the survey, but they said that 70% of people who consider themselves evangelicals believe there's more than one way to God. I found that shocking. Yes, well, <clears throat> it's, it's among a, num a number of things that you would assume would never be true yeah. if the Bible were taught in a church consistently. So that probably tells you the Bible yeah. is not being taught in the church consistently. Wow, that's scary. Let's talk about... Um, a geographical prophecy, Jerusalem. I mean, Jerusalem has always been so center in world history. Why do you think that is so important in this world and for the future? Sheila, I've been to Jerusalem, I think, eight times. Wow. And the first time I went with my father, before they had any of the modern conveniences and it just about killed me, I thought I'd never do it again. You <laughs> had to lug your luggage everywhere. And of course, we now travel with a special guy who make sure that doesn't happen. And since I've been going back, I've just fallen in love with the country. Mm -hmm. I remember standing in front of them when I was there uh, two times ago saying my love for you is un un um, unparalleled. And I want to bring a thousand of my friends back here because I know it helps your economy. It will be a blessing to them and a blessing mm -hmm. to you. And I did it. The next time <laughs> I went, I took a thousand people with me. Wow. And, um, but you know, Jerusalem is in the, in the headlines now because of the Abraham Accords mm. and also because we've moved our embassy to yes. Jerusalem. And everybody wanted to know what, what does that mean prophetically? And I think the best answer to that is now that Jerusalem is the home of our embassy, someone said this, the, the final stage is set mm. for God to do everything that the Bible says is going to happen. Um, one man wrote, uh, if, if Jerusalem wasn't as it is, Jesus can't come back, wow. but he will come back yeah. and he will come back to the place from which he went and he will land there uh, and uh, set up his kingdom. And one of the things that really, um, I, I got personally blessed by this in the process. You've been to Israel. I've never You've been, never been to Israel? Never. Oh I, want to, goodness, I want to be one fix, of your thousand. We have to fix that. <laughs> um, but when you, when you go to Jerusalem t today, you walk through the city, there's the old city, and you see all of the different things that are happening there. There's, there's an aura that comes over you. I don't think I'm the only one who feels that way. And I've always thought, well, that's where Jesus walked, that's where the Bible happened and all that, but it's, what, it's more than that, and I found that out when I did this study. Did you know that the Bible says that Jerusalem is God's own city? It's the only city in the Bible where that's said to be true, that that city belongs in a special way to God. In the book of Deuteronomy, there's one chapter where he says it five times within just a few verses. And all of a sudden you realize when you're walking around in Jerusalem, you're walking in God's city. Wow. It's God's city in a way that no other city could ever be. And there's no way to explain the, I don't, I don't want, I'm not a sensationalist and I'm not no. trying to make something no. mysterious out of this. There is an aura about being in God's own city, Jerusalem. That gives me chills. Yeah. I definitely want to go. Right. Let's move on to um, a financial prophecy, economic chaos. Why does money play such a central role in the end times? Well, maybe the bigger question, Sheila, is why does money play such a main role in everything? That's money, true. money is the enemy of. You know, you can't worship God and Mammon. You mm. can't worship both God and money. You say, does people worship? Oh, yes, they do. Mm. And, and you know, it's the big challenge you have as a believer to make sure that doesn't get its clutches into you. And in the future, 
money is going to be uh, even more so. I mean, there's a chapter in Revelation where Babylon, which is the financial city of the world, is taken down, and the whole chapter is devoted to the end of the monetary system in, wow. in our world today. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, says the scripture, mm -hmm. and it affects everything. So in the Bible, we're told that there's going to be, and this is sort of a, an adjacent topic to globalism, a coming together so that there's, there's fewer and fewer coinages and one and more and more monetary centrality. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that in our country. Yeah. We're seeing it around the world. Uh, and and it's interesting, even in light of the prophecy of the mark of the beast, mm -hmm. you know, I know that I know that there are places now, and I wrote about it in this book, yeah. where they have now put chips in the in the hands of people, and so these chips have the capability of interacting with radio frequencies, and so if, if they go to the store, it's like their credit card. Wow. They just put their chip underneath the light and it reads their hand, it reads the material in their hand. And that's happening. There's a place in Germany where they're doing this now almost on a wholesale matter to try to get everybody involved. So we're living in a time like nobody ever could have imagined. What would you say to, to believers who are afraid that, that they're going to accidentally get the mark of the beast or, or not be able to, to live in the world anymore if they refuse to take it? Well, I wouldn't say too much to them about right now because this is not going to happen until the tribulation period That's true. and if you're a christian you're not going to be here when that happens um the bible talks about there being um a, a great turning to the to the false prophet and the false and the false leader mm -hmm. and that will involve this mark which if you don't take you can't do business and you'll either wow. be starved out in the tribulation or or you will or be killed wow wow um one of the other things I wanted to, to move on to is, and we touched on it, but um, the, the biblical prophecy with COVID-19, a lot of believers have, are kind of losing hope at the moment. You have been a pastor for so many years. I mean, I, Barry and I listen to your morning, serve, morning worship service every Sunday. What do you say to believers who are struggling at the moment, who feel this world is it's, it's so hopeless? Well... There's a lot of hopelessness in the world. There's a lot of issues in the world. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, the Bible always brings us back to the fact that God is in control and that none of this has escaped his. Mm -hmm. I mean, God in. I, I have a wonderful saying a little girl said one time that God never says oops. <laughs> you know, he never yeah. says, oh, how did this happen? Right. Um, God wasn't overtaken by the pandemic mm -hmm. and the pandemic certainly has caused a great deal of challenges for a lot of people. But God hasn't changed, and he has shown himself strong in so many ways. Yeah. And, and even in ministry, I mean, that's where I, where I live. For me to say what I'm about to say, people would say that can't be. The ministries that I'm a part of are way, way stronger than they were before pandemic happened. Wow people begin to realize that there are not very many things you can put your hope and trust in, no, but Jesus true. Christ is one. Yeah. And when they put their hope in him, he doesn't make the, he doesn't make COVID go away, but he's there with you and he helps you through it. And they can sense his presence mm -hmm. in a way that nothing else ever uh, appears to them. So I think COVID is a time for us to, to be sobered in our thinking, maybe to uh, reprioritize our lives a little bit and ask ourselves, are we really living our life the way we want to? Yeah. Um, There's so many things that we thought were necessary that aren't. Yeah, true. And um, I, I've, I've just watched this unfold like that. I think it's very interesting to see how that's happened. Why do you think, you, you mentioned that obviously if you're not preaching on prophecy, you're ignoring a quarter of the Bible. Why do you think that so many believers don't know their Bibles? Well, that is a really a, a profound question. And I've thought a lot about it recently because I've been teaching the book of Colossians in my church. And in that book, uh, Paul is writing to a group of Christians in Colossae who are about to be overtaken by false teachers if he doesn't res rush in and rescue them, which he did with his letter. It's so easy for us to become 
surface Christians. We just come in, we get a few things that we like, and, you know, God is here for us, and, and uh, he's somebody you can talk to when you get in trouble. But if you don't study the Bible, you don't have the foundation, and you don't have the strength. One of the things I came back from, from the pandemic to my church with was this. The answer to all of our problems is, is not in all the things people talk about, but it is in strengthening the body of Christ and making sure we're doing everything we can to disciple the people of God with an incredibly increased emphasis on small groups uh, yeah. and on expository preaching yeah. that comes uh, with, a, with a study guide before they ever hear the sermon. We're doing that now wow. to try to strengthen the faith of God's people, because if we don't, when what is coming at us yeah. actually comes in its full force, a lot of Christians are not going to be able to stand because they have not built any strength. They have no roots in their faith. One of the things, and you've been kind enough to say that you would stay and do another program with us, but one of the things you talk about in the book that is a real heartache to me are the number of people who once were fairly prominent um, believers, outspoken, but have literally not just fallen away, turned their backs mm -hmm. on Christ. That makes no sense to me. How do you do that? Well, the Bible says there's going to be a great falling away right after the rapture and when the, when the Antichrist is revealed, there will be a falling away. And it's very particular. It's the falling away. Mm -hmm. And the word there is the word apostasy, which the word means uh, to stand apart from, to stand away from something that you once uh, said you believed. Two or three things about that are important. Number one, if a person is truly a Christian, they won't fall away. People who are Christians don't fall away, but there are a lot of folks who, who claim Christ, who go through the motions, who've learned the language, who hang around the edges, maybe even as we know from, I mentioned a couple of them in the books of pastors who did some great things and, and then they walked away and said, uh, I don't believe there is a God, I don't believe in Jesus, and I, I, they renounced their family, and it, it's, it's a really sad story. And um, it reminds me, though, that, that there's a verse in the Bible that says something like this, that in, the, in that day there will many who come before me and say, Lord, haven't we done wonderful works in your name? Haven't we spoken great prophecies in your name? And the Lord will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. He didn't say, depart from me, I once knew you and I don't know you anymore. Wow, he said, that's depart huge. from me because I never knew you. Wow. So the, it's possible for people and, and, and when I wrote that chapter, you know, there's a, in, there's a part at the end of each chapter is where do we go from it? And I said, the first thing you should do is make sure you know you're a Christian. Yeah. That's, you know, two things for a person who worries about falling away. Number one, make sure you're a Christian and make sure you're a growing Christian. Yeah. Because if you're growing, you have that internal witness in your spirit that God is at work in your life and you never worry about falling away. Yeah. But if people just and a lot of folks, they get into the church, they become traditional Christians. Some of them teach. We know some of them preach. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, you're a candidate for that. Yeah, I got a letter the other day from someone who watches the program and said, I believe, and it was from prison. He said, I believe that God took me to a prison to set me free because it was in prison that somebody gave him a Bible. And he said, as I began to dig deep into the Word of God, I know that I know that I know right. that I'm a follower of Christ. You know, that, that is a, a, a common thing for those of us who are in any kind of media yeah. because media goes where people can't go. And during the pandemic, you couldn't go to, you could, all our prison ministry were shut down. Wow. You couldn't visit any prisons. Mm -hmm. So all they had was what we could provide through, through media. And, and it's a reminder to us of how powerful that is. Absolutely. Well, as you can probably tell, you're going to want to get a copy of this for yourself and another copy for your kids if you have kids. And I'm going to tell you how um, you, we can send you a copy um, today. But first of all, as you know, here at Life, we are very committed to being eyes wide open in terms of the rest of the world. And there are so many women and children and fathers too and grandparents who are struggling in certain parts of the world simply because they cannot give their child one bowl of food a day. But you and I, we can change that. Watch this. Every six seconds, another child under the age of five dies. 
Why are young children like these fighting for their lives? It's because their mothers simply have no food for them. Malnutrition, known as the silent killer, then compromises their immune system, in turn, making them more susceptible to dying from common childhood illnesses. Statistics tell us this year alone, the mortality rate for children under the age of five will exceed five million, with malnutrition being a contributing factor in nearly half those children's deaths. The question becomes, can we stop this cycle of death for the remaining children in Southern Africa, those who find themselves in a food crisis, urgently needing help, before malnutrition claims its next victim. If we can get to these villages where this child comes from, and we can get mission feeding into those villages, what we're able to ensure is that we wind that clock back. We retell that story. That's why we say mission feeding saves lives because it does. Saving this child's life doesn't happen because of us. It happens because of you. Can you imagine six seconds, every six seconds in Southern Africa, a child dies um, and malnutrition is the major contributor. One of the things that I love about how James and Betty have set up this program is they never go into a country and as if, you know, well, here we are, we're the answer. They look for the people that God is using in that nation and then underwrite the work. And we were able to set up factories to produce the kind of food that these children need that have all the protein, the vitamins. But when, what they discovered was when children were showing up to get the food, it, some of them were able to bring something like this, a little can to put the food in. But the heartbreaking thing with a couple of the children was they came with plastic bags. And the minute that we put this hot food into the plastic, it just, it melted and it was gone. And so then they came up with this great idea of um, these orange bowls that, that literally turned from death into life. I will never, ever forget my first trip to Angola, walking into that malnutrition clinic and literally watching the last six seconds of a child's life ebb away or the look in the mother's eyes. They're just like you and me. They're moms, they're dads, they're just regular people like you and me who are in a country where there is devastating poverty and malnutrition. And I remember sitting by the bedside of a little one and it was such an effort for that little one to turn his head slightly to be able to look in my eyes. And I thought the child was maybe two months old. I discovered he was two years old. But here's the amazing news. We can change this. I've seen it. I went from the malnutrition clinic one day where I literally, in my tent that night, I remember laying on the floor and just saying, Lord, this is horrible. And I felt the Lord say, Sheila, get up and dry your face because we're going to do something about it. And then I got to go to a village in the next day where we've already set up mission feeding, hope in a bowl. That's what I call it, hope in a bowl. And to be able to give this food to these children. So we've made a commitment this year to feed 350,000 children. That sounds like a lot, but it breaks down really easily. Do you know that $30 will feed three children for three months. I mean, what can you do with $30 these days? You go through the drive through with your family and it's gone. But this will feed three children for three whole months. Perhaps you could do 50 and that would feed five children. 100 would feed 10. And we've also made a commitment to rebuild some of our clinics in South Sudan. Terrible flooding, they were washed away. And I can't imagine what it's like as a mom. Some of these mothers, they walk for miles to get to the clinic and it's gone. So we've made a commitment, we're going to rebuild the clinics. Perhaps you can help us. And remember, please, with whatever gift you give us, request this book by Dr. David Jeremiah, Where Do We Go From Here? Thank you so much. Across the continent of Africa, children are suffering, facing severe malnutrition and even death. With food reserves gone and many areas experiencing severe famine, we urgently need to replenish supplies to keep feeding the 350,000 children who are counting on us. Call now with your life-saving gift of 30, 50, or $100 to help feed and care for three, five, or 10 children for three full months. 
Also, please consider an extra gift to help immediately rebuild malnutrition clinics destroyed by record flooding in South Sudan. This urgent need is $392,000 above our normal feeding budget and is critical to help save the lives of those who are suffering most. With your gift of any amount, we'll send you Christmas Grace. This eye-opening new 31-day devotional will give you a fresh perspective on the greatest gift ever given and the life-transforming hope found in Christ's birth. With your gift of $100 or more, request the Love and Thanks Tumblr set with scriptures reminding us that God's love never fails and to always give thanks. These tumblers will keep drinks hot or cold wherever you go. Finally, with your gift of $1,000 or more to help feed and care for 100 children, be sure to request our inspiring bronze sculpture, Divine Servant. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. I'm here and just what is a small part of a massive graveyard. I've never seen anything like this in my life. But this part that I'm standing in, um, these are all children. The thing that has touched us as a team so deeply is the way that the parents have tried to honor their children in some way by leaving something on the grave, whether it's just little booties, um, a little toy that meant something to the child. I was just back there. They've just dug four more children's graves because they know they're coming and that's why we're here and that's why we need to do something now we need to be able to go into these villages and feed these children and bring hope to these parents so that these four little holes back here stay empty we need your help and we need it now Thank you so much. And if the lines are busy, keep calling. Let's do this together. It's a privilege. And for any gift at all, you can request Dr. Jeremiah's book, Where Do We Go From Here? I just want to ask you a final question. You have written so many books and I've read them all. Did you feel when you were writing this there was something special about this? Sheila, I think I told you when you were with us the last time that Donna and I were having breakfast and we had watched the news that morning and I said to her, I feel like they're dismantling our country piece by piece. Yeah. And I set out to see if there was something I could do in the framework of being who I am and what I do every day. Sure. And that's where this book came from. Wow. And you're going to want your own copy. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll see you next time on Life Today. God the Father showed me, says, I love you for who you are. And as men, so often we find our identities in what we do. Tomorrow. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.